All right, uh, Apache Con, day two, big data track. We have our first speaker, Laura Thompson, and she's going to speak uh, on Firefox crash reporting. Over to you, Laura. Hi, everybody. Uh, just as a disclaimer at the beginning, I tend to speak very fast, and I have a funny accent. So if you have trouble understanding me, wave frantically, and uh, I will try and answer that question. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk to you today about Firefox crash reporting. Um, I work for the Mozilla Corporation. Um, and I work for a little team called Web Tools. We make, generally speaking, things that are mostly web apps, um, but they tend to be weird web apps because they are, generally speaking, uh, tools that are aimed at developers. So as well as the crash reporting project, we also work on uh, performance testing and graphing uh, for Firefox builds, localization tools, uh, code search, static analysis, a whole bunch of other stuff, product delivery, uh, product updates, plugin management, infrastructure dashboards. Uh, auth, Etherpad, and Air Mozilla. And there's a really large number of projects. So <clears throat> it's web apps, but most of the web apps that we work on are not very classic web apps. Like they tend to be, have complicated infrastructural requirements and they tend to be aimed at engineers rather than consumers. So just as background. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Firefox crash reporting project, which is called Socorro. I'll talk about the scale of it, uh, how we architect it, uh, work process and tools, and things that we're planning to do in the future. So this is pretty much, broadly speaking, a case study. So feel free to ask me questions. Um, if there's something you'd like me to focus on more, I can do that too. So I'm pretty flexible. OK. <clears throat> so I'll begin by talking about what Socorro is. The project is named after a very large array at Socorro, New Mexico. Um, there's sort of lots of rumors going around because Socorro is also uh, Spanish for help. Um, but the project really won't give you a lot of help. It will mostly just catch your errors for you. Um, and it's really a telemetry system. You've probably, most of you, if you've ever used Firefox, have seen this. This is the, uh, <clears throat> the Mozilla Crash Reporter. It's actually, this code that lives in the client is part of a project called BreakPad, which was started by Google. And BreakPad is the part of the code that is embedded in whatever client it is that you're trying to instrument. So Firefox uses it, Chrome uses it, um, <clears throat> a bunch of other things use it, and most of those projects have different backends that they use to catch crashes. Ours is the only open source backend for catching crashes, and it looks like this. Um, if you want to look at this, if you have network, uh, it's crash-stats.mozilla.com. Uh, and you can click through the various reports. We do a lot of aggregate reporting on things like uh, the crash rates. So what you see there is the crashes per 100. It actually still says active daily users, but technically it's active daily installations. Um, <clears throat> you can also see probably the, the main tool that we use for prioritization is this thing called the top crashes. Um, so we take the crashes that come in and we bucket them. Um, and that is really an important tool for prioritization, right? Because if you see that there's something that's affecting a really large number of Firefox users, those are the bugs that you're going to focus on fixing first. And there's a whole team that looks at this every day, and Firefox engineers look at it every day to use it to prioritize their tasks. So if you ever get that crash reporting dialogue and think, well, why should I submit this because nobody cares? That's actually not true at all. We really do care. Um, <clears throat> you have an option to add comments and your email address. And if you send us your email address, there's a pretty good chance somebody will actually email you and ask questions um, or give you some advice on how to avoid the crash. We do things like, um, sometimes we do mass mailings. We did one to a group of people and said, hey, the reason that you're having this crash is because you have some Russian malware and this is how you can get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> so we will do things like that. Um, and if you write comments, I will read them because so few people do. Um, I would say that most of the crash comments, some people will say, you know, I was just trying to play Farmville or whatever, but um, a lot of them are, tend to be fairly obscene. <laughs> um, okay. So the kinds of things that we try to answer are what are the most common crashes for a particular product? Now, there's a bunch of different products that this is hooked up to. So it's hooked up to Firefox, uh, it's hooked up to Thunderbird, to Firefox OS, which is, uh, also internally we call it Boot to Gecko, which you've probably seen some media about this week because we just launched it. Um, and we also provide hosting for crashes to a couple of community products, um, Camino and SeaMonkey. Um, we also uh, bucket them by version and by channel. So we have four channels, a nightly, Aurora, beta, and release channels. Actually, we have kind of a fifth one, which is the extended support releases. Um, <clears throat> so we, we can look at it that way. One thing that's typically interesting to people is what new crashes and regressions do we see emerging, um, and looking into the causes of emergent crashes. So if you have sort of nightly bills, they tend to be like regressions or uh, problems that are introduced by people landing new code. But um, if you have released versions and suddenly you see a new crash that hasn't been seen before, that 
typically happens for one of two reasons. One is that uh, somebody pushed like a, a new thing to a commonly used website, like let's say Facebook or Gmail has some new piece of JavaScript that pushes on a code path that wasn't getting pushed on before. And the other one is actually malware um, or sort of plug-in interactions. Um, we can see the crashiness of one build compared to another, and this is actually used to make shipping decisions. So when we shipped uh, Firefox for Android, which is actually another product that's in there, um, they decided they wouldn't ship until it was less than five crashes per average daily, active daily installation. Um, <clears throat> we look at the correlations with a particular crash, and that's things like uh, uh, what dynamic modules were loaded in memory at the time of the crash. Are there particular correlations? Are there particular plugins that people have that seem crashy? So we see that with this crash, 100% of people had this crash had the Skype toolbar installed would be a good example. Um, and those things really help you to get to a, um, a root cause and steps to reproduce for a particular bug. Okay, so those are the common use cases. Some of the other things that we do, um, <clears throat> we have some what are called null signature crashes. If you have a crash that is caused by an out of memory error, it is actually very hard to generate a meaningful set of data um, because the memory on your machine is so messed up that it's hard to sort of do something meaningful with it. And when we get those, it tends to be like a giant blob of garbage um, and we can't sort of generate anything interesting about it. Um, <clears throat> but what we can do is say, does one build have more of these types of crashes than another? Which tells you a little bit whether a particular build is susceptible, more susceptible to out of memory crashes or whether we've introduced any new ones. Um, <clears throat> we can look at the differences between uh, different flash versions, which ones are crashier than another. Uh, detecting duplicates. We have a little bit of jitter. I think like almost any kind of firehose or telemetry system where you have a lot of data coming at you, um, we get some duplicates. And uh, one of the things that's interesting to know is we, we, we actually intentionally do not keep user information. So we, we don't know your IP. We don't know your locale. Um, <clears throat> we do that to protect people's privacy. And uh, that means that finding duplicate crashes is harder. Uh, but we can use a little bit of the entropy in the crash to kind of say, uh, these two crashes came from an installation that was installed at exactly the same date and time and had the same amount of time since the crash occurred and had the same signature, right? So we can, we can use entropy to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> we do detection of explosive crashes, which is either things that have newly emerged as one of our top crashes or uh, things that have been ticking along as like say the number 200 crash for a while and it's suddenly number five. Um, we wanna notice those and tell people about them. We did some work looking for Franken installs. It turned out that we had a, um, a stability problem where when Firefox updated um, on Windows, not all of the DLLs were getting updated. So you had sort of a, a partially updated installation. Um, and as you can probably imagine, those are really unstable. Um, but we could detect that by looking at the, the hashes on the, the, the DLLs that people had in memory at the time. One thing we've done recently is analysis of exploitable crashes. We have an exploitability tool that we can run over um, <clears throat> the crash data, which will tell you this looks like a crash that could be easily exploited, um, or this one's pretty safe. And we do a lot of ad hoc reporting for tracking down what we call chem spill bugs. Um, a chem spill at Mozilla is like a fire drill at other companies. We decided to call them, this means, you know, something where there's a big disaster with a crash and it's drop everything and work on it. It's called a chem spill rather than a fire drill because a fire drill is just practice, right? And a chem spill, something is actually wrong. So that's why. Okay, so you give you an idea of the kind of numbers that I'm talking about. Um, so I come from a sort of generic web development background and used to doing the thing where you scale to millions of users without sort of degradation of response time. Um, and this is like 100 users and a really large amount of data. So it's kind of a, a different dimension of scaling, <clears throat> but um, the basic law still applies, which is the bigger you are when you fail, you fail in really bad ways. Um, okay, so in terms of scale, at peak, which tends to be when Europe is still awake and the West Coast the United States wakes up and the East Coast is online, we get up to 3,000 crashes a minute. Um, it's around 3 million a day. We expect a 40% increase in that this year. Um, and the reason for that is because we just started shipping, shipping cell phones, um, which is a little bit terrifying, but we'll see. Um, the median crash size, so a crash is not a small thing, right? It's um, median size for desktop stuff is 150K. Android crashes are around 200K because Java makes them bigger. Firefox OS crashes are a little bit bigger again. I don't really know why that is yet. Um, we store metadata and processed stuff in Postgres. It's about 0.8 of a terabyte. Um, in HBase, <clears throat> we have around 110 terabytes under storage, but it's actually only about 40 terabytes of data because um, the replication factor is three. Um, 
this has a pretty solid expiry policy and I worked out, um, you know, this gets deleted sort of, it ages out at six months. So we're recording a really large amount of data in a year. Um, I did a blog post just recently, I figured out that we do um, process a billion crashes a year. So, okay, implementation scale of it. Um, I said around a little over 120 physical boxes. It goes up and down depending on what we're doing. Um, it's not in the cloud, it's in a data center. Um, people that deal with HBase know that it's, I think it's getting easier now, but at the time we started with HBase, it wasn't very realistic to do it on, uh, on cloud stuff. Um, so it all lives in a data center in Phoenix. We have around 10 developers. We started with one. Uh, we have DBAs, we have a sysadmin team, we have a fifth of a QA person, and access to our Hadoop Ops people. Um, <clears throat> right now we deploy one to two times a week, but we're hoping to go to continuous deployment. Actually, I said within the next month, I'm kind of hoping it will be like next week or the week after. So that's kind of where we are. Any questions thus far? Okay, so that's the big picture. Let me talk about how it works. There's this great diagram. Um, we had a contributor that used to work on our project who was a graphic designer, and I explained to him how the system worked, and this is the diagram he drew, which is terrifyingly complex. I think it is, it's actually slightly dated now. Um, but it is representative of the complexity of the system. Um, these diagrams are donated by a guy called Mark Irons, who actually uh, died quite recently of cystic fibrosis, so I just want to acknowledge his contributions. Um, okay, so... Having looked at that diagram, uh, I said to uh, one of my co-workers, Lars, Sakura really has a lot of moving parts. And he said, well, I prefer to think of them as dancing parts. Okay, so I'm gonna try and make that diagram a little bit simpler for you as we go through. Um, I'm gonna talk you through the lifetime of a crash. So, um, Firefox crashes. Uh, the built-in brake pad client packages up the crash. Um, actually, I'll go to the next one. And it submits two files. Um, one of them is JSON metadata, and one of them <clears throat> is what's called a mini dump. If you're familiar with a core dump, a mini dump is like a core dump, only smaller. Um, the format is actually developed by Microsoft, um, and you know, so basically it's a binary blob. This is sort of the, one of the complexities in the system too, not that it does a lot of transactions, but that um, the data that we're collecting is binary, and that sort of makes lots of things not work as well as they might. Like, it requires sort of special thinking. There's been various iterations of the system um, for what to, what to do with these blobs. At the very first iteration, they were going into Postgres, um, which at that time was not a good idea. Um, <clears throat> then we moved to shoving them to NFS, which was kind of okay, but then you can't do anything analytic with them. Um, so we moved to HBase. So those crashes come in via an HTTP post. They are collected to disk by the collector. Um, the collector here, this is all one physical machine, this top thing. Um, the collector here is <clears throat> a Python app, it uses web.py, runs via ModWiski on Apache. Um, and the collector, it's really simple, it's like 40 lines of code, it just takes in the files and writes them to disk. It has a, um, uses a Radix file system organization system so that things get allocated according to the um, month, day, hour, minute that they came in. Um, from the file system, we have another process called the crash mover, which basically picks up crashes and shoves them into HBase. Now, if you're looking at this diagram, you are probably thinking, is that a queue? Yes, it is. It is actually like sort of a really, really terrible excuse for a queue because we shove them in the file system. Um, there's been a lot of work on the project about replacing it with something better. Um, unfortunately, it's a source of great bike shedding, and this actually works kind of well. Um, okay, so once it gets into HBase, there is a process called the monitor that looks for crashes coming into HBase. And when it sees that they have come in, it assigns them for processing. We have a set of processes that pick up a process, uh, pick up a crash from HBase and do a bunch of things to it. Um, the most important thing that they do is they spawn off a process called Minidump Stackwalk, which takes the Minidump blob and talks to a symbol server and reunites the crash with its symbols and generates a stack trace, right? Um, that sort of enables most of the other things that we do. Using that stack trace, we generate what is called a crash signature. So the classic crash signature is just the name of the function in which you crashed, right? And sometimes that's useful enough. Other times it's not very useful. Um, if you crashed in JE malloc, not useful at all. Like you, so you crash when you're assigning memory, but you're not really interested in that, you're interested in what you were doing when you were assigning that memory. 
Um, so we have some configuration stuff called a skip list, which is basically a set of regular expressions that says these functions are not interesting, so skip the next thing in the stack. Um, okay, <clears throat> from there the processor can do a bunch of other things. Um, but the main thing that it does is it writes processed crash information metadata into Postgres and the full processed crash back into HBase. And it is now also writing um, indexing information to Elasticsearch. Uh, I was thinking about this in the keynote yesterday. <laughs> Every project has uh, more than one data store. This project actually has four right now um, because there's memcache in the front end as well. Any questions about that so far? Yep. So you store the entire 20 megabytes in the HBase or is it going to the file? Sorry? Do you store the entire 20 megabyte crash inside the HBase? Yes, we do. Um, so they're not 20 megabytes on average, I should say. Um, they're about 150K on average. 20 megabytes is the outlier. We actually um, have in our Apache config to cut them off at 20 megabytes because usually there's a handful that are bigger than that and they can be really, really, really big, like they can be gigabytes. Um, it'll, it'll tie up our client. Um, it makes people angry because it ties up their internet connection, especially if they're on a phone. Um, and those crashes are always worthless. Because if you get a crash and it's 20 gigabytes, it's always an out-of-memory cache, like it's just garbage. So, um, okay. Any other questions? Yep. So why not write back into HBase? Why use Postgres? Why, why split? Why use Postgres? Um, so the reason that we do it is we do a lot of um, sort of random access to data and we do a lot of aggregate reporting. Um, and we have a few things that use MapReduce, but a lot of those things are really simple to do with SQL um, and quick to do with SQL, and that's why. So, yeah. If you think of Postgres in this model as being like the world's largest web app cache, you wouldn't be too far wrong. Yeah. Okay. Question. Uh, when, when say the graphics you have a uh, elastic search, mm -hmm. is that sort of like search engine based, uh, working on the edge base or? So elastic search is, um, uh, basically a fork of Lucene. Um, and the reason that we do that is that some of the, there are sometimes, we're just sort of experimenting with it at the moment. Um, I actually hope we'll ship it in two weeks, but it's been sort of a, an ongoing experiment. There are things that, searches that people would like to do that are hard to do against Postgres. For example, we don't store in Postgres um, all of the stack frames, because um, they can be a lot. And it's sort of not terribly relational data. Um, we probably could, but this seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and sometimes people want to ask questions like, give me all the crashes where this method appears anywhere in the stack, um, and where uh, this uh, method appears as the third frame on the stack. Yeah, things that are like really expensive to do in SQL. You could do them with MapReduce, but it's really fast to do them in Elasticsearch. Um, so it's sort of a way of doing real-time reporting. And I know that there are more and more real-time tools on top of HBase, but this is kind of our attack on this. So yep. You're doing the Postgres. Mm -hmm. Yep, Postgres as well. Not, yep. Uh, not the actual page side. Yep. Okay. So, um, I think I've talked about all of that. It's mostly if you're reading the slides later and trying to work out what I was talking about. Okay, the reporting side of things. So, we have a really large number of crons um, that do a lot of really important things, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have the three data sources, HBase, Postgres, and Elasticsearch. In front of those, we have an API, which we call middleware. Um, it's not really middleware, it's just a resting an API. But the purpose of that is to isolate the source of the data from the end user. Because if you're writing a web app, you don't really care whether a particular piece of data is stored in Elasticsearch, Postgres, or HBase. Um, you shouldn't have to care, so it's all encapsulated. Um, the web app, we are replacing uh, an old PHP web app with a Django web app. Um, actually, we're running the two in parallel right now until we get sign off on the, on the Django one. Um, and that uses Memcache. That's kind of the, the front end architecture. Any questions on that? I think I have a couple points on my slide. So, cron jobs. Um, the kinds of things cron jobs do is copy interesting data into fact tables rather than sort of like uh, tables that are full of everything that comes in. Uh, we get our active daily users slash installations from a, an external database, which is actually Vertica. Um, the number of active daily installations, which we use for a lot of like important stuff, right? Like uh, how many users are affected by this crash and so on. Um, that information actually comes from Firefox block list pings. There's a thing called a block list. Um, once a day a Firefox calls home and says, 
are there any plugins that I shouldn't use? Um, and we say, yes, you shouldn't use any of these versions of Flash, Flash is usually the common example. Um, but counting those pings is how we count Active Daily installations, basically. Um, <clears throat> so those come in from Vertiga. We do a bunch of aggregate calculation. We do that top crashes by signature as a daily cron job. It's really like old school, um, but it works really well. We used to run it hourly, um, and our users told us that they didn't need it hourly, so we skipped it back to daily. I think that one thing I anticipate doing the next year is actually going to make that real time, and I'll talk about why a little bit later. Um, we have to notice builds on the FTP server. Um, this is a horrible, horrible way of doing this. But right now, release engineering has no good way of communicating to us when a build is ready or what its build ID is or anything like that, so we, we scrape FTP. Um, we match known crashes to Bugzilla bugs. So in Bugzilla, there's actually a signature field that contains the signature crash, and we have a cron job that looks at Bugzilla and match, matches up the bugs of the crashes. You might have seen that in the original table. The reason for that is so if I am doing triage while looking at crashes, I can say, okay, all of these crashes have known bugs. That one doesn't have a bug associated with it. So the first thing I need to do is to file a bug for this crash. Um, and there's actually a link that you can click on that will start you filing that automatically. We do duplicate detection. And one of the things we do that's kind of funny, this is very Mozilla, um, is to dump a bunch of CSV files which have like a summary of today's crashes. And then engineers will take that and do stuff with it. Um, like they'll shove, shove it into couch and do some analytics or they will have like a collection of very small tickle scripts or whatever. Um, this is very Mozilla, it's very anarchic. And the classic thing that happens is somebody, people will play with this analysis, play with this analysis, play with this analysis, and they'll come and go, hey, I've got this really good idea for a report, and this is how you do it in Couch. Um, and we will turn that into a MapReduce job or a Postgres query um, and implement it in the, in the web app. Okay, so reasons for putting all of our data access through Restian API. Um, is also to enable people to build other apps against our data platform. Um, we also did it so that we could rewrite the web app with minimum pain. There's been, I'm really like anti-rewrites. Um, I think a lot of us are. If you've ever rewritten something from the ground up, you know that it's horribly painful and takes a long time. Um, and one of the ways that we made this easier was by um, moving all of the data access into this API and then rewriting the web app actually only took us about three and a half months. It was easy. Um, we've been experimenting with off and on because there are a lot of long running demons in this, like the processors, the collectors, the crash movers. Um, we've done experiments with embedding into this middleware, uh, giving each component its own API so that if you have a long running demon, you can ping it and say, hey, what, do you, what, what job are you working on? What was the last thing that you did? How long did that take? What's your general health? Um, we don't have that in prod right now, but I would like to put it back because I think it's a, a really useful thing to do. Okay, uh, with the web app. So some of this data is pretty easy to visualize. Sometimes it's really hard to work out how to visualize something. So one good example was that um, the engineering team came to us and said, all of your visualizations are in clock time, like it's crashes per day and what happened on this day. And what I actually want is to have the crashes in build time. Like I want to see um, for each build what crashes over this time period. So it's kind of like adding a fourth dimension. Um, so that was fairly challenging, but we did figure it out. You can take a look. Um, and we've just rewritten it. Okay. So one of the things about this architecture is that one of our goals is to have components be pluggable and easy to switch in and out, right? Um, all of the back-end components have sort of a simple fetch, transform, and save architecture, so you can change what the fetch, where the fetch comes from, right? So the collector has basically the same architecture as the processor, except the collector collects from a post and the processor fetches from HBase. But you plug in where it fetches from. The transform is pluggable, and the write is pluggable, so any of the storage options that we support. Um, to give you an idea of like what that means, um, as an experiment, one of the back-end architects decided that he would like to see how small we could scale this. So he wrote a um, Python signature processing and turned on file system storage for crashes and has it running on a Raspberry Pi. He didn't want to run HBase on a Raspberry Pi for fairly obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of cool. Um, but that's actually a common option. There are, because this is all open source, there are a bunch of open source users of the product. Um, and a lot of those people have a really low volume of crashes. Like they might have tens or hundreds of crashes per day. And again, they don't need to deal with Hadoop, so they will turn on file system storage. 
Um, and it's pretty easy to write your own. It's well documented on how to do that. Um, to give you an example of some of the people that are using this, uh, Valve uses it, so Steam is instrumented with this. Um, Spotify uses it. A lot of games companies, because Valve went and talked about it at the Games Developer Conference and then it became cool. Um, a bunch of like mixing <coughs> desk and audio companies. And the newest thing is casino gaming companies. So this is in poker machines. It's really strange. Um, but yeah, so there are a bunch of users and the fact that it's sort of so switchable makes it easier for people to configure it the way that they want. In terms of the implementation details, um, it's all Python 2.6. PHP 5.3 is a bit of PHP that's going away, which is in the web app. We have Postgres 9.2. We use Memcap for the web app. One of the things that causes a lot of pain is because most of our code is written in Python. We use Thrift to talk to HBase, um, which is painful. I would like to change that to something else. So that's an area of experimentation. But we are not in a position to rewrite in a JVM language. Um, we, for HBase, we use the Cloudera distribution of HBase, version 3, update 4, but we are hoping to switch to 4 sometime soon because I want the HA name nodes. Um, there's little bits of C++, mini dump stack walk is C++. We have some MapReduce jobs written in Java. We have some store procedures written in Perl. And the thing that is getting more and more use lately is pig. Um, because you tend to have engineers saying, what I, you know, I want more than to be able to like, run stuff against this CSV or query or API. And I'm like, here, use pig. And they're like, I've never heard of it. You can teach yourself in a day. Go away and <laughs> come back when you have questions. Um, and it's, a, it's a really nice tool for this. People find it really easy um, to dig into the data that they need. Actually, funnily enough, I think they find it easier than learning SQL, which is odd to me. But each to his own. So, mm -hmm, question. Yep. Uh, you said that you use Swift for the mm -hmm. Options like uh, the Java, uh, you know, the client provided by HBase. Have you so uh, not recently, but it's on my list to do this year. Um, again, we went with Thrift. I guess we've been using it for three years now, and back then there were not a lot of other options. Um, okay. Now I think the the field has expanded, so it's a good time to look at it. It's actually something I hope to learn a little more about this week. So. Okay. Yep. So, but you are running very, you think it, the Thrift is running very well, right? No, actually it's not. Right. Um, it runs like crap, let's be honest. Um, one of the issues that we have had with Thrift is monitoring it is hard. Uh, there are two reasons for this. So, we get a lot of Thrift errors. I would say 1% of Thrift connections end in error, All right. which makes it hard to monitor because you have to monitor thresholds, you can't monitor errors. Um, but I understand that part of it is because the, the way that we do connection handling is not very friendly to thrift. Like, we tend to make it crash. Um, so, so we actually, we're rewriting that, uh, um, and I would like to move to something else at some point. So mm -hmm. what, uh, if you have a lot of errors, how you recovery, do you? Oh, okay, so everything that right. talks to thrift has a certain number of retries, and it uses exponential back oh, okay. off for retries, yep. Okay, thank cool. you. Try, try not to kill it more than necessary. But so we don't do pooling, um, and we need to, so. So in the future, mm -hmm. do you have any other plan to, to rewrite or re use other software for the client? Too? Yeah, so it's just a little library. It's called hbaseclient.py, um, and we would like to rewrite that. So yes, we, I mean, we're rewriting it to be less hard on Thrift, but I actually wouldn't mind replacing it with something other than Thrift as well. Again, it's pluggable, so whatever we use should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, I do not claim that the system has a, you know, it's, it's a big, crufty system that we've been running for a long time, and I know there are lots of parts of it that are far from optimal. Oh, sorry. So that's all right. No, it's good. It's good. Thank you for the tools. Thank well, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll talk about our work process and tools. So one of the things to know about the system is that it, we don't have a specified SLA, but it needs to be up because uh, the system being down blocks shipping Firefox. Right, so that's sort of the, the key thing um, and tends to make like the VP of engineering scream at you and stuff. So it uh, needs to be up. How do we work? Um, funnily enough, based on this morning panel, I will tell you that, uh, and actually lots of political things recently, the project is hosted on GitHub and we have been delightedly happy with it. GitHub is awesome. Um, to respond to something else slightly topical, we're actually also a distributed remote team of 10 people. Okay, uh, so working on this, when you want to work on it, you make a GitHub fork. One of the things that I think people have found challenging in terms of getting new contributors to the project is it's actually really hard to install. There are a lot of pieces. Um, we have done some work with using VMs, but I'll talk about the challenges of that in a minute. 
Um, assuming you get over the hurdle of installing it, you would then submit a pull request to us with a bug fix or a feature. Um, we code review every line of code. Everything gets reviewed. Um, doesn't mean that we find everything that's wrong with code. We also have um, a GitHub hook so that uh, Python code can't land unless it's PEP8 compliant. So you're not reading code for style, you're reading it for um, correctness. One of the other things we do is actually when you submit a pull request, we run this great tool called Leroy. And what Leroy does is when you have a pull request, it um, simulates merging it, takes the merged build, and runs all of your tests on it. And we'll give you like a little indicator in GitHub, if this landed on master, tests would pass or tests would not pass. This is like tremendously useful for us um, because it makes code review much easier. First of all, you're not getting any code that is sort of horribly ugly, and second of all, you know that it's gonna pass tests, so you can just focus on semantics. Um, like this is a good way to do things, this is not a good way to do things, I think you've kind of taken the wrong approach here. I think like code review is really important, um, but it tends to use your most senior people, so anything you can do to reduce the, um, sort of the, the very straightforward parts is good. Okay, from there we have, we run uh, Jenkins for CI. Uh, it polls GitHub master, picks up the changes, uh, runs all the tests on it, and builds a build, which automatically gets pushed to our development environment. Uh, changes that we want, we merge to our release branch, which Jenkins also builds, and pushes to our staging environment. We have a QA team that runs acceptance tests. Um, on staging, it's actually also Jenkins, whereas our Jenkins instance runs unit tests, theirs runs acceptance tests, which are mostly based on Selenium. Um, and once they give us the thumbs up, we push it to production. So our deployment is all pretty seriously automated. Um, it's running a single script with the, the builder's parameter, and it pushes it out to however many machines and restarts anything it needs restarting and so on. Um, we're about to automate that even further, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, just an aside, which is that we have not been doing continuous deployment for the last how many years? We're about to. But switching on continuous deployment is trivial now because we built all of the automation and testing and tools that we needed to switch it on. That's the good news. So configuration management. Um, some releases will involve a configuration change and we control and manage all those through Puppet. Again, we push configuration changes to development and staging the same way that we push them to production um, because it minimizes errors. Uh, I'll talk about virtualization in a little bit. People who are web devs and just working on the web app don't want to have to install HBase. They find it pretty challenging. So one of the things that we've done some experimentation with is using Vagrant. Um, it's a little Ruby tool that lets you script uh, virtual machines. Um, and it builds on top of VirtualBox. So it will actually create you a virtual machine with the most recent build already installed on it. So you can just Vagrant up and start coding, which is really nice. Um, and again, we use Puppet to actually configure those virtual machines the same way that production is configured, and that's been tremendously helpful. The hard part we found is um, finding the right packages, because sometimes packages are not available for the VM, um, especially the HBase packages, the Postgres packages, things become available and then become unavailable, and you end up having to make your own. It's really challenging. So this is failing right now, for example, because of the HBase packages. The other thing that's challenging is the um, virtual box is only available, uh, the base box is Ubuntu, whereas in production we're running Red Hat. The second thing that's really hard is doing any kind of development is having a useful amount of data. Our data in, um, includes uh, personally identifiable information, so private stuff, because we know what, what website you were looking at when you crashed um, and the contents of memory, which could contain your password, your credit card number, all kinds of stuff. So, um, it is hard to share that in a secure way. We do have a, a fake data instance and scripts for generating a set of fake crashes now, um, and that's really helped a lot. Okay, so things that are in the pipeline. Um, we have shipped and rolled back, and we'll ship again today, a thing called CronTabber, which is a, um, a tool that we wrote for cron job synchronization and dependency management. Um, one of the things that happens is because we have so many external data sources, sometimes things will fail. Like, let's say we're sucking. The thing that fails the most often is actually getting the, um, the usage numbers from Vertica. It fails a lot. Um, and you want to be able to auto-recover um, on failure. We are doing more and more use of StatsD and Graphite for performance measurement and monitoring. Um, sometime in the next week or so, we're going to start using Chief. This is a tool that was written at Mozilla. It lets you deploy a build from IRC. Um, 
And the thing that we're still talking about, which is not built yet, but I'm excited to build it, is the idea of having tri-servers, which we do for Firefox, so I feel like we should do it for web apps too. And the idea of that is to have a bunch of different staging environments where you can stage different branches of your code in parallel, so you don't have like a single staging environment that's a bottleneck in your, in your deployment process. So, um, things we have coming up. We're doing more and more reporting, uh, garbage collection crashes, uh, some of these are now done from the first time I wrote this list, but a signature summaries which say things like 75% uh, of these crashes occurred on OS X. Um, we're doing faceted search with Elasticsearch. We have a side project called Dragnet which takes the DLL information from crashes and we're trying to create a crowdsource directory of DLL information, which is actually really useful. I don't know if you know this problem, but... Um, you're looking at a crash and you know what DLLs the user has and you don't recognize some of them. You go, well, some of these are like standard Windows DLLs, but I don't know what any of those things are. And some of them are, you know, the software they have installed. But one thing you would like to know is, are any of these things malware? Because that's a really common cause of instability. And it's really hard to Google DLLs. Malware vendors, which might seem like a funny term, but they do exist, um, will actually set up websites to tell you that this DLL is a real thing when it's not. Um, so we're trying to come up with a, a crowdsourced way based on this vast pool of DLL information that we have. Um, we're doing more sort of exploitability analytics, more ways to query the data, opening our API, uh, better reporting replicas for Postgres, Pig, Elasticsearch. Uh, we're trying to get a real queue, which has been a massive bike shedding effort. Um, we've been through a number of options. Uh, I think that the thing that is in the lead at the moment is Kafka. <laughs> That's the good news. Um, we have a grand unified configuration system, which I'm pretty excited with. And uh, the big thing that we're doing this year is turning this into software as a service so that other people will be able to use it. Uh, everything on the project is open source. Uh, it's under the MPL, Mozilla Public License version 2, which is compatible with most other OSI licenses. Um, you can look at the site, which you will not see private user information unless you are uh, logged in and authorized. Um, you can fork it, you can fix bugs, you can contribute or read the documentation, uh, join our mailing list, and come and hassle us in IRC. So. Thank you for attending. Does anyone have questions? Yep. Oh. <laughs> yep, I think I had this guy first. Uh, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Are you going to make the slides available? Yeah, I just literally gave them to the organizers. Yep. Okay. So, cool. In your organization, do you separate the development team and the operation team? Um, organizationally, yes, but in reality, not very much. Um, we work really closely together all day. Um, Oh, sorry. I'll speak the microphone and I'll also repeat the question, which was, uh, do we separate developers and operations? Organisationally, yes. On a day-to-day -day basis, not really. Um, we all work pretty closely together. So, I actually wrote a blog post about this, which you can see on my website, talking about like a recent troubleshooting exercise that we went through. Um, I think it illustrates how, how well we work together. That took a long time, because I think we didn't have a traditional DevOps culture five years ago when I started. But um, it takes time and sort of going through hell together to build trust, I think, and now we have a pretty good trust level. Um, we all have access and we all have sudo, but um, mostly don't use it because I, I think that sort of the key question if someone says, I would like sudo on production, if they say that, then they probably shouldn't have it um, from a developer perspective. Um, but yeah, we, we have access, but mostly it is uh, ops jobs to maintain stuff. Yep. Next question, there was one, yep. That's all right, sorry. So uh, I guess I'm wondering why, or if you've considered using CentOS with VirtualBox, and, and uh, I guess the other question is, mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about the configuration system? Sure. Um, I know there was a reason that we didn't use CentOS, and now I can't remember what it is. I think it was uh, library compatibility, version compatibility. Um, we actually talked about using Scientific Linux because it was closer, I think, to, uh, to RHEL than CentOS was at that time. So the second question was? Um, the uh, configuration system. Mm -hmm. Can you dive into that a little bit more? Or talk um, <clears throat> yes. So there's a, I think there's a whole talk on it at PyCon in two weeks. Um, but the, the nice thing with this configuration system is uh, one of the goals of it is to be able to simply configure. So all of the code is on every box. And you can transform a box from a collector into a processor or whatever by just changing the configuration. Um, which is really nice for sort of managing changes in load and things like that. Um, it has a lot of options about uh, 
the style of configuration file that you can use. You can use basically any standard configuration format. Um, I probably should get my, uh, one of my colleagues to give you the spiel, but feel free to get in contact. I'll introduce you to him. So. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. So it, it sounded like a lot of the analytics are done in, in SQL or Postgres. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a reason that aside, well, was there a specific reason you did there instead of in HBase or? Sure. So I think we're doing uh, more and more analytics in HBase, particularly I think a lot of the ad hoc stuff gets done against HBase. Um, I think the reason is actually organisational. We don't have uh, a good Hadoop culture, I think. Like this is, um, we have a metrics group that use it pretty heavily, but for us it was kind of a, a learning experience as we went along. Um, as I said, I think we're getting better at it. Part of it is like a, an organisational resistance to Java as well, which is really, it's sad, but honestly that's one of the reasons. Um, and now that people have other options like Pig, they're much happier, actually. It's silly, I know, but yeah. Okay, thanks. I will also say probably the people got a little bit scared. I think the first year we were in HBase, it was super unstable. So, yeah. I just, uh, I'm quite curious, because it's as if you've embraced the fact that there's just, you know, billion, was that a billion you said a year crashes? Yeah, a billion a year. Mm -hmm. how, how much is any of this doing? To, to reduce... How much of that is? Any of this work doing to reduce the crash rate? Okay, sure. Do you know what I mean? How much mm -hmm. of this is yep. actually, you know, beneficial? Yep, that's a good question. So uh, the crash rate actually goes up and down, right? Um, we fix the most common crashes, like that's the goal. But... Uh, the increases, we actually, when we saw like the drop in our user base, we actually saw a drop in the number of crashes. It's kind of depressing. But um, for an individual version or product, we try to reduce the crash rate. However, um, we're always adding new products. And so when we introduced uh, WebRT or Firefox for Android or whatever, that increases the number of crashes. Um, I expect we'll see a lot of crashes from Firefox OS this year, for example, because it's, it's brand new. Um, and a lot of different hardware, anything that's embedded in the hardware is going to have more wrinkles to it. Um, but I mean, it is a priority. There are, so there's, in terms of Mozilla engineering, there are a few different projects that work. There is Crash Kill, which works specifically on solving um, crash-related bugs. There is Snappy, which works on responsiveness. There's Memshrink that works on reducing the memory footprint of Firefox. So all of these things have like five to ten people working on them just that consistently. Um, and fixing crashes is actually something that's worked on by like every engineer that ever touches Firefox. So it's, it's a really high priority for us. Stability is actually, he says stop, I was going to say stability is actually pretty good. Um, we believe that based on some of our other analytics that users tend to fall into two camps, like people who never crash and people who crash a lot um, based on particular patterns of behaviour. So that's, that's an interesting area for us too. I think I've been told to stop, so thank you. Feel free to ask me questions like outside or later in the bar or whatever. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you.